Celtics Talk Podcast is presented by 24autogroup.com, 11 locations across New England. What's up, everybody? Welcome into the year-end edition of the Celtics Talk Podcast here on the NBC Sports Boston Podcast Network. What a wild ride 2022 has been. We've got Eddie House jumping on to kind of look back at it all. I mean, we were celebrating a year ago. It was like Joe Johnson buckets were the big thing. Celtics were three games under 500 in mid-January. It's wild to see just how far this team has come in a year span. And uh, so we're going to try and look back and pluck out our favorite moments and uh, just try to put it into words what this team has accomplished. Also coming up, we're going to we're gonna look back at uh, Wick and Pags, the, another a, a episode of The Last 20, and uh, a little bit about the Brad Stevens hiring and everything that's gone on in sort of the modern era that has delivered us to this championship stage. Well, let's start uh, with looking back on 2022 as a whole. Let's get into my conversation with Eddie House. All right, Eddie House. Got your shirt? Y'all good? Yeah. Make sure <laughs> you, everybody needs to know that. God is dope. Yeah. For real. I mean, I, I was I was I was joking before we jumped on. I saw I saw you in your short sleeves and I was I was asking what the weather is like. It's uh of all the unbelievable things that have happened in 2022, and we're gonna talk about it like Celtics related, but it's 60 degrees in Boston today, Eddie. And uh, I do not know what to do with myself besides go in the backyard and swing some golf clubs because uh, it's it's ridiculously absurd. Well, I mean, it's not 60 degrees here. It's close to it. It's overcast. And uh. as long as it stays that type of weather, when I come out there, <laughs> I'm good with it. Let's keep it going. Bring your, bring your shovel uh, just in case. But uh, hopefully we'll not be digging you from uh, from the studio back to your back to your hotel. All right, I, I just want to start. Like you got to jump on this wild ride with us last year. Think about one year ago today, uh, as we record this on the afternoon, Friday, December thirtieth. Like this was about the time that Joe Johnson was scoring a bucket for the Celtics, and that was like the biggest storyline for a team that was three games under five hundred in the middle of January. Did you did you ever think that it would unfold the way it has? No, not at all, because I remember me and Abby, we were doing a game in Minnesota, and I mm-hmm. think it was the 30th or yep. some, somewhere right there at, at the end of, of the year. And I was looking at this team like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> what what direction are they going in? Is Eme the right guy for them? Yeah. Is Do they believe in him? Do they believe in each other? And then I started really diving a little bit deeper and was like, well, this team really hasn't been together like that. COVID protocols, guys being in and out of the lineup, they ne- never really had a chance to get it together. And then the energy shifted after the tweet. Mm-hmm. And he was right about that. You know, it, was. Uh, the energy did shift. And you could see, like, now they're starting to play together. Guys aren't out because of protocol. And then the next thing you look up and, like, wow, they put together a four-game win streak. Oh, it's going. Oh, they're playing. They look like they are a formidable team. We might have a chance. And then before you know it, you know, they just did exactly what they were supposed to do um, and, and probably what they thought that they were going to do coming into the season and contend for a title. I think one of the underrated aspects here is, is as we were all losing our mind about how this team was underperforming, and there were certainly, there were so many different reasons for that. As you said, Ime trying to figure out his way and the COVID thing just sapping your roster for most of December, but I give credit to Brad Stevens because he sort of had the vision and stuck with it. And then even in mid January, as this thing started to take flight, like think about that. That's only a couple of weeks before the trade deadline. And he still decided like, we're going to go all in. We're going to move some, a first round draft pick. We're going to make a deal and go get Derek white and add to this instead of subtracting and really just hit the right buttons to, to help put this thing into another gear. So I think Brad deserves credit, but when you look back, and so the one thing that always jumps out to me that that it was January twenty third, and Tatum went for fifty one down in in Washington. Washington, yep. And I, that was the first time I said, "Ooh," because Tatum always goes up a level in the second half, and it felt like, okay, this thing might have a chance. But did I know they were going to rip off twelve of the next thirteen, and then like twenty seven and five over the next thirty two, or whatever the crazy number was? No, like when did you start to think, "Oh, okay." This this has a chance of being something. After they started ripping off those big yeah. chunks, right? It it was because you you still like, oh, they got a shot, right? And they're going to get into the playoffs. It started looking like, 
they're going to get in the playoffs. Look at the momentum that they're gathering. Look at how guys are playing. They're playing hard. That's the one thing that I was looking at is like the difference of play, the level of play that they were doing and then communicating. They were talking on defense. They were helping each other out. They were sharing the basketball. And to me, when I was seeing that, I was like, ooh, okay. They got a chance to get into the playoffs. And then it went from they got a chance to get in the playoffs. Like, no, they got a chance to actually really do something special here if they continue to build on that. And I think it was just, it, it, it was almost, it was an avalanche. It wasn't even a snowball. It was an <laughs> avalanche, what they did. And and I'm looking at it like, I can't believe this is the same team that I've seen yeah. before, but it really wasn't. It wasn't. Uh -huh. in, in December, that team wasn't together. You know, it, guys were out. Al was out. JT was out. Um so you had Peyton Pritchard was in the starting lineup. Uh, R Romeo Langford was starting. Romeo games. Langford was. I in, mean, yeah, due you know, to we just forget. So it was not the same team. So then when I looked at it, it was like, okay, they finally are getting whole right now, and mm -hmm. what a great time to get whole going towards the end of the season, as opposed to being whole and then trying to patch it up going into the playoffs. So it was it, it was surprising for me, but then you could feel it. It it, it was something that you could feel. Like yeah. it wasn't, oh, I'm just seeing it. No, I actually felt it like, oh, this is for real. And I'm not just saying it because, and I was telling every people, everybody that, like, oh, you're just saying that because you're a Celtics and you're a Celtic <laughs> fan. I'm like, no, I'm telling you it because Whoa. I can feel it and I see what's happening right now. And they just continued to build on that. That starting five was such a wrecking ball from like mid January straight through the April finish line. And you just felt like, okay, there, this isn't like a, 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 a hot streak. This is legitimately sustainable. And the defense was, you know, which was very good most of the year, even as they were struggling, just felt like they had something. You felt like it could be something. But I thought one of the other big moments for me in the regular season or maybe towards the uh, it start of the playoffs was when Ime came out in April and said, you know, we're not a track team. We're a basketball team. We're not running from anybody. And I thought that was huge because a lot of us were sitting there as they were surging to the number two seed and thinking, hey, this is an ideal. You're going to get a, the Nets in round one. You have to go through go, uh Milwaukee in round two, like whoever in round three at that point, it felt like they were setting themselves up for a, a potentially devastating path. And yet I think that Ime's confidence in them and their confidence in themselves really permeated. Uh, like, But still, like, what were you thinking going into that playoff run? Did you think that they would kind of find the magic that they that they had during the regular season. I was I was like everybody else. And I mean, I know I'm on record on camera mm -hmm. on, you know, saying this. <laughs> I was like, we might not want to play the Brooklyn Nets. Yeah. You know, we might want to try to stay away. And I was totally wrong. I can admit that. I was wrong. Again, you don't want to limp into the playoffs, right? And that's not, that's what they didn't do. They didn't limp into the playoffs. They ran into the playoffs. Like he said, we ain't a track team. We ain't running from nobody. But, but they was actually running to all of the smoke. You yeah. know, they really wanted to see everybody. Because eventually it's like this. If you want to win a championship, you're going to have to go through whoever it is who's ever in front of you. And most of the time, it's going to be formidable opponents. It's going to yep. be opponents that really think that they have a championship op opportunity. And I think the fact that they went through the Brooklyn Nets the way they did mm -hmm. in the first round just changed the flipped the whole energy on life. Wait, we are coming here to do this, <laughs> and we don't care about what's happening, who we got to see. And then they get tested and have to go seven games with mm -hmm. Milwaukee. Grant Williams steps up, has a big game, and that's usually what happens. Guys that come off the bench, uh, role players, have big games and big moments, and that propels you to the next, mm -hmm. either to a uh, to the next round or to a championship. And then again, another game seven. It goes down to the last second, but it it almost like I feel like they dominated that series against Miami. Uh -huh. But the fact that they turned the ball over so much right. and gave Miami so much hope and so much opportunities – that it made it a game seven and that's no slight to what Miami was doing or anything like that but that's just mm -hmm. to me that's how that 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 series went so now you went from sweeping a team that was supposed to be that 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 team playing seven games against a, a former championship team seven games against championship pedigree team you know and, and coaching staff and organization mm -hmm. now you come to Golden State I felt like it was the actually I felt like it was destiny for them right. to win that championship last year but you know Steph Curry has something else to say about that. <laughs> Steph Curry the only man who can step in and, and alter destiny uh in that moment 
What were your favorite moments from that that playoff run? You, you mentioned the the Grant Williams game seven, which you know game seven is a weird. You can have the Kelly Olynyk game. You can have some crazy moments. I kind of go back to game four of that Milwaukee series. Celtics down two one. They went down double digits, I think, in the fourth quarter of that game. And you're like, huh? Do they have it? I think you know is that they just kind of kind of wilt against a championship caliber team like Milwaukee. And Al has that dunk on Giannis and is flexing, and you know it felt like that moment. Sort of to me, when I look back at that series, like really jumps out and just all the vibes after that game. I was like, okay, that could sp- springboard them forward to whatever comes next. What were your favorite moments from the uh, from the playoff run? Uh, that was that was one of my favorite moments. I think that was actually my favorite moment because of this, because it was big bad Giannis, right? Yeah. And Al Horford, not Jason Tatum, like he did on Christmas mm-hmm. Day, but Al Horford, you know. Ah, and then a little elbow afterwards <laughs> yeah. and screaming. And that meant so much, not only for what Al was doing, but I feel like it meant a lot for the team and the organization together as a whole. It was like, we ain't scared of the big bad wolf. You know, I know he's supposed to be this, he's supposed to be that, but watch this. And this ain't even our best player doing that to you. So, like, that was that was like a, a my favorite. That was actually my favorite moment to see a, a OG go out there and do that, not settle go through the face of the best player in the world at the time and dunk that thing and create so much energy, especially in a game like that, like you said, it could have been bad if we lose that game. Mm-hmm. So let, let, the, we know how it all plays out. We're not going to linger on uh, on the finals. The summer is crazy too. You add Malcolm Brockton, Danilo Gallinari, then the whole Eme situation. Rob gets surgery. Gallinari gets surgery. What? As we said before, we spin it ahead to 2023 and, and start thinking about where this team might go. What were you, what were you thinking as the calamity of the summer goes on, and what if it, what does it mean to see the Celtics start the way they have here at the start of the 22-23 season? Well, I, I always figured this that I know it left a distasteful. It, it was a not a good taste in their yeah. mouth, right? The way that they lost was one of those things where it's like the whole summer. I'm quite sure that's all they woke up Man. every single day thinking about. And the summer's short because you went so far into the playoff. So it was a very short summer before you actually got to get back to work. Um, You might have took two weeks off and you're right back at it. But those two weeks, you might have been on vacation. You still were thinking about it. There's no way that they weren't thinking about that every single day. And that was a drive. And you've seen guys come back in being better. I like the fact that they got Malcolm Brogdon (laughs) because I felt like that was a missing piece. Like that was a the way. And we've seen it this year. When things get kind of raggedy, he's able to settle things down. He could finish at the rim. He knocks shots down from three when he's open. He plays solid defense. Uh, you know, Gallinari, I thought it was a great addition uh, to the team, be able to spread the floor. Wow. Uh, I don't think that he's as great of a defender as some uh, of the other players we have, but that's not wouldn't that's not what his job would be, and he's a big body. So he could always be a great team defender, right? And so – I thought that was a good addition. Uh, unfortunately, he went out. Then when you look at all the stuff that happened, Rob getting surgery, and then also with the Eme situation, yeah. things are up in the air. And my first thought was, okay, this is a make or break time for this yeah. team. Where are they going to go? Which direction? They're in the fork in a row, right? And they chose the path of greatness, right? Like, we're going we're gonna to make this happen. And all Joe had to do was come in and say, I know you guys. We all know the situ- uh, We all know the situation, but what we have to do is remember where we were last year and where we're trying to go this year, and it's not getting away. And let these guys be them. And I think that's even with the last two games you've seen that. I mean, Damon made some good timeouts, yeah. scored some good timeouts um, uh, during some games. But the fact of the matter is, I think that this team knows how to win. And when you have a team that knows how to win, you just don't want to get in their way. You want to help them win so now let's let's start spinning it forward a little bit i mean you said it that this team is 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 a little bump in december but looks more like itself here at the finish line rob coming back i could do a whole podcast on that i'll spare you my my (laughs) my 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 my, uh shenanigans with that but when you evaluate this roster how are you feeling you know i think a lot of us as they were steamrolling teams at the start of the year thought don't know if they need anything. Don't know if anyone's going to come in and replace a Sam Hauser or a, be a backup big or whatever the case may be. But if you're Brad Stevens, how are you feeling as you go into 23? Are you, do, you, do you need to make any moves before February to, to tweak this thing, or are you content with what they've got? 
I just don't think you need to recreate the wheel right now, yeah. right? What we got going is working. And everybody, this is the thing. When you have a team where they're like this and everybody really respects each other, the guy at the bottom of the totem pole can talk to the guy at the top of the mm -hmm. totem pole the same way the guy at the top can talk to the bottom. Like there's no, you're better than me. You can't say this. Everybody has a voice. It's hard to, when you split that up. That can't, because a lot of these guys are friends, right? So yeah. when you split that up, we all have feelings. We are humans. That can change a dynamic of a team. Like, even though it could be for the better, you're adding somebody who hasn't mm -hmm. been in the trenches for training camp, who hasn't been there the year before, who wasn't in summer league with these guys and seen the growth and the development of certain players. So I think that the only way you make a move is if that you're looking at somebody, you're saying, man, he's playing so bad, he's not doing anything for us. Mm -hmm. And I believe that this guy can come in and help us out and without getting stripped. You know, without getting right. stripped, but be able to do that and add to your team. But for the most part, man, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We heard that saying for forever. Yeah. So I, I like what's going on. And I know Sam hasn't been shooting the ball particularly mm -hmm. well, but shooters shoot. And if he continues to get in the gym, stay in the gym, trust in his work, it's going to come back around to him because he's getting good looks. Yeah. He's just not knocking them down. So, I mean, and Peyton Pritchard, when you get your minutes, go out there and ball out. Be the energy. Be the uh, energizer bunny. Do what you're supposed to do because all of those things do add up before yep. you know it because everybody sees them working. If you're putting in that work, they'll still trust you. If you're not putting in that work and you're Southern and you're over there on the sideline with a, a sulky type of uh -huh. attitude, then, yeah, you might have – somebody might – but that's not the case with this team. I think this team is like this, and if it's not broke, don't fix it. Just continue to try to uh, encourage them to be the best version of themselves. I love the chemistry part of it. I think that's such an overlooked part of it. Like it's an NBA 2K roster construction thing where people just divorce like emotions and all you have to do is roll it back. I mean, I know it's bigger in the grand scale, but like 2012 in the, or, or, uh, in the Celtics trade park, like it was, it, it, it's killed that team. Like they, they, they didn't know what to do and, 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 and react to it and then kind of get the focus back. And so it, uh, it, it, it's a good point. Like even on the lower side of these guys have some crazy continuity right now. And I'm with you. I trust Sam. I think he's been better defensively than I thought he would be. I think he can hold up in that end. And as long as he like keeps that confidence up with the shot, even if it's not going in, he can be a, 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 a someone who they, they won't lean on in every playoff game, but can definitely give you minutes. And especially when you need the shooting. And I just don't see anybody who can come in and necessarily replace him in terms of what you have for tradable assets. And I like Peyton right. Pritchard's depth, right? Like, I feel like Malcolm and Marcus are going to need time over the second half of the year, and you're going to need to have a high-energy uh, guy like like that on, on your bench. I like the construct of it. I'll be interested. You know, maybe the buyout market. Well, look, 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 before before I ask you for any final predictions, what was that like when they went out at the, the 2008 deadline and they brought in PJ, right? Like, is it easier to bring in a buyout guy in that situation and, and just, you know, hope he can help you? Um, like, can that help the team? Because they do have the disabled player exception. They'll be able to outbid some players. Can a buyout guy be sort of the one thing that might be able to help this team? Yeah, because I don't think it disrupts what's going on. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, PJ came, Sam came. Yeah. Right? And so, also, those guys came with, PJ came with Cache, right? A OG that been on, been in the trenches, been in tough games, playing, playing for Pat Riley, playing against the Knicks, being – uh, being in the playoffs, he's had has been a guy who has been in the playoffs and knows what it takes to win. Uh, has been on the other side of losing, never had got that championship, but was looking to try to get that and knew what it took. Right, didn't get heavy minutes, but got meaningful minutes and was meaning and big time in the minutes that he got. Wow. Same thing with Sam. Sam didn't get heavy minutes, but in the minutes that he got was very meaningful. Right, and I was a guy who kind of got put to the side after all season playing for Sam to have meaningful minutes. Right. Understanding that every every series takes an identity of its own, uh -huh. you know, and being able to realize that and understand that if you do bring in a guy in that has that mindset, I think Blake Griffin is a perfect example. Yeah. Of that. You know, is a perfect example that you bring in a true professional, a guy that's been there that understands that we're trying to win and does whatever it takes to win. They understand that you might, your number might not be called for two or three games, but then when it is called, be ready. You might not get shots because that's not what the game or uh -huh. 
this series dictates, but it does dictate you being physical. It dictates you being a rebounder. It dictates you being a defender. It dictates you setting great screens to get the guys that shoot the shots, uh, get them open. Yeah. So I think if the buyout market, is there somebody out there available? I don't know who would be. We would know that when it comes to that sure. time. But I think that's something that if Brad Stevens and he's been a magician, you know, he sprinkles that magic out there. Don't <laughs> he? he does a great job of sprinkling magic over this, this franchise. And if he's able to find somebody that he could plug in and don't disrupt what every, everything that's going on, that doesn't feel like they're bigger than the Celtics brand sure. and they're bigger than anybody that's already been there that just wants to fit in and try to win. I think you go for that. I, here's my my outrageous prediction from December 31st or December 30th, and we can I'll delete this tape when if it doesn't happen. But when Blake plays big minutes against Giannis in the playoffs and is a serviceable defender like we saw at times on Christmas Day, we'll look back and be like, wow, Brad knew at you know when he added him to that roster that there would be a moment, and Blake was ready for that moment. And maybe that's maybe that's the tipping point. Maybe that's just just enough to help you win a tough series uh, against uh, the the Milwaukee Bucks. But I need a big I need a big prediction from you. How, how's this? How's 2022 was wild. Uh, what's going to happen in 2023? How does this uh, How does this season end? Jason Tatum wins the MVP. Damn. Tatum's going to win the MVP, and and I hate doing that because sometimes it's the Lakibosh or whatever, and I don't yeah. want to I don't want to do that. So I'm gonna knock on wood while I'm saying there you it go. because I really believe if he continues to play the way he's been playing, that and they continue to win, that it will be no. No way that you couldn't give it to him. You have to give it to okay. the best player on the best team. And we've seen voter fatigue before. Before And Jokic has a great opportunity, right? He's been balling. And they're in first place, tied for first place yep. with the Pelicans. Only a, a game or a half game out from the best record. So <laughs> if he the... continues to put up big numbers like that, maybe they have voter fatigue. If he oh. puts – puts up big numbers and they're still at the top of the West, that'll be a guy that can challenge Jason Tatum. But if Jason Tatum and the Boston Celtics continue to win and he continues to put up these numbers, he will be the MVP. That's going to be my, it's not that much of a bold prediction, but that's as far as I want to go. Yeah. I feel like if they put this together, you know what we're trying to do. We're trying to put some on (laughs) these. And don't worry. Uh, Like I said, I'll have producer Casey uh, carve up this film and bury it somewhere beneath our uh, our studio in case uh, we get these predictions wrong, but we're we're okay to be optimistic. I mean, my other my other prediction was going to be like Rob wins Finals MVP, but I'll just keep that to myself for right now. No, but, you already you know. let it out there. So you, <laughs> hey, you know what? Speak it into existence. There Speak we go. It into existence. I love it. Just the, the way. But a lot of people told me Rob was never going to amount to anything, and well, uh, well, like I said, I could do a whole, I could do a week's worth of podcast on that. But Eddie, uh, we got to get ready for 2023. Busy week. Jokic, Luca. It, this this ride doesn't end. So uh, uh, rest up. Get your uh, bring some flip flops to Boston. It's going to be like I said, the start of your of your visit. Your next visit could be nice. Oh, I can't wait. I can't <laughs> wait. See you out there. Happy New Year, man. Look no further than the award winning twenty four Auto Group with over twenty six hundred vehicles in stock. The brands you love, backed by the savings and service you can count on. Visit today. Or shop online at 24autogroup.com. We're kicking off fall with big savings at Stateline Chrysler Jeep Dodge Ram. Lease a new Ram 1500 for $369 a month during Ram Power Days. Hurry in and you'll be saying, I got mine at Stateline. All right, good stuff from Eddie. I mean, I just, I just still can't believe it. It feels like there was 27 seasons crammed into one Celtic season. Uh, Celtics finishing the year 60 and 22 overall. Like, I mean, it's been a really successful year, and uh, I don't know if any of us could have really seen it coming based on where they were at the uh, end of 2021. Don't go find that episode. I don't know if we were quite as excited and dreaming of championships uh, back then, but uh, you know, this is the the way it is now. It and uh, we got a chance this week on 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 Celtics pregame live and postgame live. The last 20 series has looked back on the Wick Grosbeck, Steve Pagliuca era and delivering that title in 2008. But we're shifting it forward to a little bit of the modern times and the acquisition of Brad Stevens uh, going out and getting Isaiah and Kyrie and the Durant pursuit. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been pretty crazy all around the Celtics, not just 2022. Uh, but let's look back. Here's Wick and Steve reflecting 
on the modern Celtics. Brad Stevens leaves Butler in July of 2013 and shocks the basketball world uh, by becoming Boston's head coach. Ends up leading the team to three conference finals. Well, I think the thing I really want to hit on here is that shock. Uh, folks who follow the team, this came really out of nowhere. So, Wick, start with you on this one. What could you shed any, could you shed any light on how that developed and how everyone was shocked by this, very surprised by this move for, for Brad, Brad leaving Butler? Yeah, we were, we wanted Doc to stay candidly and help rebuild the team. We had lost in the first round of the playoffs in 2013. It was time to uh, really build the team back up, but that didn't mean uh, asking Doc to leave. But Doc, Doc decided to go to the Clippers, so we were left with a void there. I happened to be talking to Danny. Steve also talks to Danny, talked to Danny all the time back then. In this particular conversation that I was having, he said, Wick, what are you looking for in the next coach? And I said, um, you know, I've watched you become frustrated over the years, Danny, with sort of old school thinking, sort of like baseball rules. You can't, baseball has its old school stuff. You can't celebrate. You can't do this and that. Well, basketball has some of those too. And we had a little bit of it. Um, you know, the starting lineup has to finish the game, you know, or everybody will be insulted. That's a little bit of the way we were being coached. And Danny's like, why don't we just play the five guys who are going to win the game? And like, literally there were arguments about this. That's a small point, but it's just, it takes energy. I said, why don't you find a meeting of the minds? I want a young coach. I want somebody that can bring new ideas and you have new ideas and we sort of upend the league. Let's, let's start fresh. Let's, in fact, I went so far as to say, and this is just me talking in, in one conversation, and there were many with Steve as well. In this one conversation, I said, I don't want a coach that's been fired in the NBA before. I don't want to retread. So let's get a new coach. He says, it sounds like you want a college coach. I said, I guess I'm open to that. And he said, and then it's got to be Brad Stevens. So that they went from there. It's interesting. Uh, about, I think it's two or three years before Brad came here, um, Danny and I went down to to watch the Final Four. My son had played for the Duke team. And... Um, and, and and we watched the championship, and that was and and Danny turned to me before the game, and he said, uh, "The best coach in college basketball is down there," and I said, "Yeah, Coach K," and he said, "No, Brad Stevens," which I was I was surprised. So he had he had Brad on the list and was very high on Brad. And Wicks right, uh, you know, today's game uh, much more analytics involved. Um, Brad is Brad is a disciple of the analytics. You know, he's a, he's a great leader and a coach as well, but uh, really really. Uh, fit in with the approach we were trying to take to have it have kind of a state-of-the-art fact-based approach give all the players all the information they needed to play their best and so when he came up and interviewed him and by the way that was a, f a funny story um i think wick uh, uh really liked the idea brad and, and we were talking about it. And he said Let, let's just go down to zionsville wick said let's just go down to zionsville and he called me up at the six in the morning and said let's go to zionsville i wasn't planning on going to zionsville that day but i think saturday we flew down to, to, to zionsville and and it was uh, kind of right right out of the movies uh, Brad had moved out of his house and he was with his mother and he had a dog and, and his wife and they were running a basketball camp. It was 110 degrees. 110 degrees. And so we pulled up in, this, in the neighborhood and sat around a kitchen table and talked about the Celtics. Uh, uh, Mike Zara was there. Danny was there. Wick was there. We talked about what the Celtics meant and, and why he should take a leap from his, his great position to Butler to, to this iconic franchise. And by the end of the meeting, uh, uh, Brad said, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested. And, and, uh, and I, think we, 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 I think we asked Mike Zara to stay till, till it got done. Uh, luckily, luckily, Brad's uh, agent and lawyer is his wife, so it was really easy to do. Although she had to leave during the middle of the meeting because these are great people. She had unclogged toilets at the local high school that they had a basketball. We camp weren't sure if she was totally on board with the Boston move. Um, we thought Brad was showing great signals, and we weren't positive. We love Tracy and respect her. Brad insists that she was all in on Boston, but she was not showing all those vibes at the time. And when she had to go deal with the day camp crisis, we signed him up, and then we fled to the airport. <laughs> That's the truth. You can ask Brad and Tracy. They'll corroborate that. The end of one era leads to the start of another. In June 2013, the blockbuster trade of Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce to the Nets sets the gears in motion for the future of the franchise. Eventually, those undrafted, uh, unprotected picks become Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Uh, what kind of emotions were you going through? Which start with you. Uh, as this moment finally arrived, like all good things, they must come to an end, and that era did. But then Danny was obviously uh, setting the wheels in motion uh, for the for what turned out to be quite. Uh... Well, 
Well, it's really easy as ownership to say, we'll never trade this person. We're going to finish the career together. There's a lot of great vibes about that. A lot of great, um, you know, history of, of players staying with one team for their whole career. But there's also a time to say it is time for a change. And if it's also okay with the player and benefits the player, you know, Kevin got a new contract when he signed with the Nets or got an extension. Paul was happy to go to the Nets and have a fresh choice. We, we've retired both of their jerseys. We're close friends with both those guys to this day. And that sounds like an overstatement or a name drop or something, but it's just the truth. We're, we're bonded for life, um, with those guys. And so we did trade them to, to Brooklyn uh, and Doc was gone, you know, and we just started over. And we're very lucky to um, have gotten that hall of picks and players and to have Brad come in and just sort of, uh, you know, build it back up. And we're really, um, we have always believed that you have to be, you know, patient. That doesn't mean just sit around and not worry about anything, but it means build for the future instead of doing band-aids every season. There's some teams in the league, I think, maybe, uh, that, that sort of do a band-aid approach or a quicker fix. I'm not trying to put other people down. It sounds like I am, but I'm trying to trying to say we try to avoid that. So we're happy if everybody's 24, 25, 26, we're going to play for a couple of years. And that's really the kind of team we have now. Now we've added some vets, you know, this summer, but we built up to last year by playing Jason and Jalen and Marcus together. And, and really it wasn't band-aids. It was building with these guys and believing in them. And that's why, our core, I, you know, I think is pretty strong. Yeah, I, th- I think Wick uh, talked about patience. I, patience is a key attribute, and I think one of the things we've tried to live by um, and really uh, develop the team for the long term and to win championships. We we don't just want to finish second or make the, make the playoffs. It's to win championships. Um, and, you know, we have a partnership with the players, both at the NBA level and certainly in the Boston Celtics level, where... Danny and and uh, Wick, myself, Brad, Rich, were talking to the key players, and those three players were fantastic because uh, we wouldn't have made this trade without their help. and And they saw an opportunity to go to the Nets, and the Nets were ranked, I think, to to possibly win the league that year until they had injuries to their own players. Our players played great for them, but uh, but they had a couple of big injuries to their key players. So so I, I think they knew it was a great opportunity for them and a great opportunity for us to kind of start again. And uh, we've kept that relationship all these years. Kevin was back for his his uh, debut of his film here, and uh, and and we just saw him for the big 75th anniversary, um, and he was very emotional about it. So Paul and Kevin keep coming back. We we love to welcome them back every year. Um, you know that was hard because we lived with them for so many years, and 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 walking in that building was very hard for all of us. That's the one. That's the one downside. The really hard thing about sports is to become very close to the players. And then for whatever reason. Um, you need to make a trade. You need to make the team better. That's the goal uh, of winning a championship. Um, so we have to part ways. We always try to do it on on a very friendly basis and, and a basis where we're, they're always welcome back. And, and we've had several players leave and come back, and, and, and people love to play here. Franchi- uh, uh, players want to come to this franchise, which is fantastic. Moving along past 2013, uh, we'll get to an unforgettable individual season in 2016-17. Steve, starting with you. Isaiah Thomas um, in 2016-17 had an amazing season and brought a lot of excitement to this franchise as it was building up uh, to where we are now. He was named All-NBA second team, fifth in MVP voting, and many memorable fourth quarter performances that we all remember. Uh, Steve, just talk about that singular year and what Isaiah did for the the excitement of Boston. It really kind of fit in with the style of the city. Yeah, IT is just an electric player. Uh, The first day he came in here, uh, I was at the facility and and uh, I don't think he understood the Boston market because he said he wanted to go to lunch. And I said, I said, well, let's go someplace that's out of the way because you'll be you'll be mobbed by people. He said, because nobody nobody knows me. I'm I'm five feet. Yeah, I think he said he was five feet ten. He's really five feet seven. Again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On the moon, maybe it's just like. And so we drove we drove out of the parking lot and we went we went somewhere on one twenty eight. Uh, I think to illegal seafood. And, and as soon as we got into the mall, uh, even before we got out of the car, a couple of a couple of people were walking down the street. They go. IT Celtics, they're screaming his name. So he 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 really was shocked um, and excited to come here. And uh, you know you'll never forget the the IT time in the, in the in the fourth quarter. I don't I don't think we've seen a more electric player in the twenty years okay. than Isaiah. Special guy, special person, special player. Too bad he got seriously hurt, but he's still playing and glad to see it. And now we'll 
move forward to monumental player personnel news since 2015. There's been quite a few things that have happened in this area. Uh, first off, Boston became a destination for first-tier free agents. Uh, Al Warford in 2016, Gordon Hayward 2017, Kemba Walker in 2019. It's quite a change from prior years and even decades. Uh, why, Wick, did this, do you think this happened? And what are your thoughts on this positive change where Boston is now absolutely a destination uh, even before, you know, even before you guys were, were in the championship this past season? But starting with Al in 2016, guys want to come and play at Boston. Yep, you know, Al Horford referenced at the time, part of it he's referenced to fan support. He loved playing in Boston because he just loved the way the fans support the players. And we haven't talked enough, I think, uh, about the fans today, meaning we haven't. Um, but they mean everything. And it's very, very different playing in Boston for uh, for these fans. And, and the love, uh, as Steve just mentioned with IT, the love that the fans have just uplifts everybody. But also when you're building a team patiently, when you have young pieces, young players of great quality, great potential, you know, it's exciting for, for guys to come and, and build and be part of that. We want to be a destination. We want to be one of the, and we're the Celtics. You know, this isn't, you know, Team X from wherever. This is the Boston Celtics and it means something and, and we're cognizant of that. We're just trying to build on it. You know, play, players players uh, really want to come to get championships, and I think people have realized over the 20 years that we, we go all, all in to try to get championships here. And, uh, and, and that's our goal. And secondly, I think Boston has become, uh, uh, the, the, the fans have made it a fantastic destination. It had a history that it's, it's gotten over. Uh, we, we, we were leadership in building the Bill Russell Civil Rights Statue. It's one of the only sports statues that really represents civil rights as well as a great athlete. And you can see right now there are flowers at that statue commemorating all the things that Bill did while he was here. So, so, so players really bought in and were attracted to winning championships, the city, the fan support, and and they often come here. And and in this great organization that's been created by Wick and, and the group here, they come here and say this is this is really the top class of NBA basketball. You know, we, the facility we have out in in um, in Austin, uh, New Balance facility is just the Arbeck Center is incredible. It's one of the best in the NBA. Uh, our medical staff is, is is the best in the NBA. Our trainers are the best in the NBA. Our scouts are the best in the NBA. So, 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 so they see that, and they see that's an opportunity for them to do something that's very rare, win a championship, and hopefully we're gonna make that happen. And then there's the blockbuster near miss in free agency: Kevin Durant in 2016. Tom Brady was among the recruiting contingent, of course, in the Hamptons. Uh, so I just wanted to look at the details on how the greatest NFL player of all time ended up assisting with recruiting one of the best NBA players of this generation and of all time. This was definitely one of the most uh, unique Boston sports moments in history. So Steve, start with you. I think I always see the, the picture with you and Tom and Kelly Olenek, but anything that you could pull back on, on how Tom ends up with you guys and what that conversation with, with Kevin Durant was like. Oh, it, it was, it was surreal. Um, we we learned that Kevin was a big fan of Tom and always wanted to meet Tom, and uh, we have a very close relationship with uh, with the Patriots and uh, and the whole staff down there. And uh, so Tom was made available to us, and and we really thank Tom to this day. Uh, now we were a little naive, thinking we could sneak into the Hamptons and and no one seeing us. That picture wasn't supposed to be supposed to be taken, but but Wick and I and, and, Tom, and Tom were walking down the street, and they snapped they snapped that picture. Um, and uh, and Tom Tom was great. And I, what I remember about the the, the pre meeting was funny because Tom is a very disciplined guy. So I think that day I'd lasted say the least. That day lasted uh, at least nine hours, and we were waiting waiting for the meeting, going flying down there. It was a Fourth of July weekend, and uh, and so we all met, and we were, we were starving. It was like two o'clock. We hadn't eaten. The meeting been delayed, so we went to an Italian restaurant, um, and 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 so they brought out a bunch of food, but Tom. In the entire time, he's talking to our players and ourselves about nutrition, and all he's doing is sipping sipping on lemon water. So for the whole nine hours, he he, he maybe had, had three quarters of a cup of lemon water. And I remember when Tom would turn to talk to players, Wick and I would grab some minestrone, or grab some calamari, and eat because everyone was embarrassed to eat in front of, in front of Tom, the disciplined guy. And then when he went in, he made a great pitch for the championships, you know, for the Celtics and and why to come to Boston. Unfortunately, we weren't successful and. And 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 uh, and he was lured out to the West Coast, but we always appreciate that effort that Tom made. Tom Tom was a, uh, a season ticket holder. He used to come to a bunch of Celtics games. His sister 
uh, as well, uh, uses the tickets or used and, and still occasionally does. It, then it just got, the town got too big and he, you know, didn't, it just wasn't as enjoyable, you know, to come to the games and be mobbed. But he's been a fan for years and years and we really appreciate it. Blockbuster trades as well. The main one was the Kyrie Irving trade in August of 2017. He verbally committed to stay in October 2018 in front of fans at a season ticket holder event, but then changed his mind, uh, has had a change of heart, left in the summer of 2019. Could have sent the franchise on a downslope, but again, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown emerged as the future. Uh, obviously, again, through the 20 years, there have been lots of ups and downs, but Wick, I'll start with you. There, if you could, the ups and downs of the Kyrie Irving uh, experience in Boston and what to take out, what you guys took away from that. I here's what I took away from it. I he he really tried and he gave us a great. The first season went great and then he got hurt unfortunately as we went into the, uh, towards the playoffs. Um, I remember having lunch with him down in New York during that summer after the first season and we talked about Bill Russell. We talked about championships. We talked about maybe putting his number in the rafters if he was able to lead us to a championship. And just that kind of warmth, and and um, uh, and he did want to stay, and you know said to the fans, "I'm sort of planning to stay." And then he changed his mind, and you know you're allowed to change your mind. And we don't want anybody to, we don't want to ask anybody to be inauthentic. We want to just when people want to be here, and uh, you know it can really go great. And if it's not the right fit, that's life, and I respect it. And so we're fine, and we. Are friendly with Kyrie. I saw him in the playoffs and spoke with him briefly. And you know, there's it, he's got fully entitled to do whatever he wants to do and play wherever he wants to play. And we wish him the best. Well, for Kyrie is a is a I'd say a transcendent basketball player for sure. And he gave us a, a great season. Um, and I think he's searching for where he wants to fit in. And and I think uh, uh, he decided that this wasn't the place. And and I and I give our organization a lot of credit. Uh, that could bring a lot of organizations down to lose a transcendent player like that. But um, you know, there there was no there was no uh, uh, crying and, and no regret. Was, Kyrie wants to do something else. Let's move on. And and Danny made some great trades and and great draft picks and and the guys all the guys stepped up. And uh, and now you know now we're here. You know you know back really a contending team. Uh, I think we could have contended with Kyrie, but I I really take pride in the fact that our players stepped up and and didn't say. Oh, you know, we're not going to make an effort now because we lost a superstar. Uh, we we're creating new superstars and uh, and uh, and going onward and upward. So so uh, I, I Kyrie went to Duke. I, my son actually played with him. Um, so so we we know him for years. We wish him the best of luck and all the players that have played here. But uh, I think what I take away from it is our team does a great job. Our management team and the coaches coming back from adversity. And that was a, that was a tough day when he decided not to come. But. Uh, they didn't spend any time worrying. They just spent time making the team better, and now we're contending again. So I'm, I'm really happy about that. All right, it's been an amazing year. I want to thank uh, all y'all that have hung out here on Celtics Talk. Shout out to our pod crew behind the scenes that have had to put all these together, especially on game nights. Uh, I got the easy part. I just yell for a little bit, and they uh, make their magic happen and get it to your eardrums for us. But I really appreciate it. It's been fun to do the post-game pods every night after these games and uh, getting to reflect immediately on how it's all gone down. It's also fun to look back. Like I said, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little scared to go back and look at my predictions in early January of this year when I was thinking like the Celtics can't just be a middling team. I know for sure I said they should go for the lottery if they couldn't put it together. Luckily, they put it together. And uh, Jason and Jalen going to a new level. And Derek White and adding Malcolm Brogdon this summer. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to chronicle it all. So thank you for uh, to everybody that's been along for part of the journey. Thanks to everyone who's already liked, subscribed, but you know, if you haven't, for whatever reason, you gotta go do that. Uh, you know, and keep keep it up. We got a, we got a whole bunch of games here to launch into the new year. It's gonna be crazy. Uh, let's have some fun and we'll uh, see you along the way. All right, uh, like, subscribe, all that stuff. We'll catch you next year on the Celtics Talk Podcast.